If you want to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Judges chapter 14, Judges chapter 14, the title of my message this morning is The Warning Signs in Life. You know, everywhere we go in life, there are warning signs. If you do any driving at all, you know that there are signs along the roadway that will point out dangers that are, are coming up. And uh, it, only a fool ignores those signs. To do so could lead to injury, possibly even death, if you ignore those warning signs on the road. There are warning signs that our bodies uh, give us from time to time. And many of us know all about that too well. And where pain or tenderness and uh, uh, fatigue, all of these are indications that there are problems in the body. And again, if we ignore those signs, it may lead to a serious illness or possibly even death. And then there are warning signs that our minds send out. When there is a, a problem and uh, feelings of maybe sadness or hopelessness, uh, feelings of anxiety, um, all of these unwarranted feelings that, that uh, come over us can lead to, if we ignore these signs or these warning signs that are coming from our mind, uh, that can again lead to a more uh, serious mental illness. And uh, then there are some spiritual signs. And that's what we're going to focus on today. There are some spiritual warning signs. There are times when we just slack up in our commitment to God. When we don't attend church regularly, where we don't pray like we used to pray, where we don't read our Bibles like we used to read our Bibles. There are times when we harbor bitterness and unforgiveness. We hold on to hurts and we harbor hard feelings and, uh, towards others. And there are times when we flirt with sin. And when we, we're in areas where we, ha, as a Christian, have no business being at all. And when those signs are ignored, those warning signs that uh, something's wrong, and there's a lot more that we could mention, isn't there? I'm sure maybe some come to your mind. But when we ignore them, we are headed for shipwreck spiritually. And so it's a, there are some warning signs. And in our text here, Samson manifests all the signs of a man who's headed for a lot of trouble in his life. And so let's begin reading there at Judges chapter 14 and verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 9. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines, now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother uh, to uh, Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and, he, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he, re, he turned aside to uh, see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands, and went on eating, and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Let's pray together and just ask God again to have his way. Our Heavenly Father, as we get into your word this morning, I pray you help each of us just to draw a circle around ourselves, realizing, Lord, it's me that's here, Lord, in the need of prayer. It's me that needs to hear from heaven. And I pray that you would use me, that you would empower me to deliver the message you've given me, Lord, and that um, you would also fill the hearts and minds of each believer here to help them 
understand and apply. And if there be anyone here that's not saved, may they understand the urgency of the hour for them, that today is the day of their salvation, should be. And so we pray your will is done. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so these are the spiritual signs, or we'll look at them here in the life of Samson. He had a lot of signs, of warning signs that came up in his life, and he ignored them. And he traveled on further down this road that would uh, dishonor God and that would uh, literally uh, lead to his own destruction, his own death. And so as Samson took these first steps down this road of ruin, he had no idea where it would ultimately uh, lead him, uh, where he was going. He, he had, he had, if he had just listened to God, if he had heeded the warning signs in his life, if he had done that, he would have avoided a lot of the problems that would later uh, come up in his life uh, because he ignored them. But as we'll see, there, there were signs that should have stopped Samson in his tracks. There were signs that, that uh, uh, should have sent him in a new direction. And we look at the signs, that, these warning signs that were in Samson's life, and be honest, we uh, hope to see that there's also a lot of warning signs in our own lives. And, and may we see the danger of ignoring these warning signs, these spiritual warning signs in our own lives today. So first of all, I want you to see the first warning sign that came flying up in the life of Samson was Samson's desires. Nothing wrong with some desires, right? But these desires that Samson had were clearly wrong, and I want to point them out to you. The desires that gripped his heart, the desires that motivated his life, the, the thing that controlled his thinking completely was uh, it should have been a, a warning flag and uh, that there are some problems just around the corner. Look at his desires in verses 1 through 3. What did he desire there? He desired a woman. He desired a woman. Now, again, we all have desires in our life, but to the extent where Samson was, this was a sin. He, he tells his parents that he has been to Timnath. Nothing wrong, uh, you know, of that, but Timnath was a village that, that belonged to the tribe of Dan. Apparently, the Philistines had captured it, and they were uh, occupying this, this city. But on his trip to Timnath, what does the Bible say? Samson saw. He saw a Philistine woman, kind of like Eve when she looked upon that tree, that one tree that she should have avoided completely. And so here Samson saw this Philistine woman, and she caught his eye. I mean, I'm sure, no question about it, she was probably a very beautiful woman. And he uh, tells his parents to, hey, mom, dad, get that woman for me. I, I think it's almost comical the way he uh, responds, but very disrespectful, I would say. But the word her, H-E-R, in verses 2 and 3, it's in an emphatic personal pronoun. It has the idea that his parents are to get her and nobody else. To get this woman in Timnath and nobody else. His mind's made up, and, he, and what he is saying here is, I'm not even going to consider anyone else. She is the one. Paul, oh, I tell you, you need to be careful. Um, you know, and sometimes as a young person, you fall in love. That, that You know, we talk about love at first sight. Yeah, I, I believe that can happen. And, but that's where we need to be careful because love doesn't solve all the problems. You can fall in love with a pig. I mean, you can fall in love with somebody that's um, got some bad characteristics and you don't even know about it yet. Uh, usually what it comes down to is lust. That's where Samson was. He didn't know this woman. He didn't know where, who she was, what she believed, what she thought. All he saw was her appearance and he really did lust after her. but And, and so he said, I'm not going to even consider anything else. And it's worth noting here that Samson's life can be summed up by the events surrounding three women. Samson had a woman problem, and it wasn't, it, and it didn't have to be that way. I'm not going to blame the women because Samson was one going out looking and going out uh, pursuing uh, these relationships. But those women were the woman, the woman here 
a woman of Timnath in Judges 14. And then there's the harlot of Gath. Well, I uh, may have time, not today, to look at her, but uh, in Judges chapter 16. Then the one that we all are very familiar with is Delilah. Delilah, also found in Judges 16. But if these women had not been a part of Samson's life, really all we would have known about him was what we had earlier uh, looked at is, is his birth, the circumstances surrounding his birth in chapter 13. And it, it's, I don't believe it's a stretch to say that if Samson did not know these women, chapters 14, 15, and 16 would not be recorded in the Word of God. And um, uh, if, if without these three women. So these three, and they were ungodly women. They were not believers. They were ungodly women. They limited Samson, Samson's service to God. And they shortened his life. Now, Samson may not have been, well, in fact, he was very strong physically, right? But he wasn't very strong spiritually he had no self-control at all. Have you ever met someone that seemed to have no self-control? I mean, you look at them wrong or you say something wrong, and boy, they fly off the handle. And they are always more than willing to give you a piece of their minds. And uh, they have no control. In fact, sometimes they lash out physically. And so this is kind of where Samson was. Uh, he was strong physically but he was weak spiritually. Uh, and by the way, true strength, it's not measured by our physical strength. It's not measured by what you can lift. You know, we can go out here in the parking lot and do a weightlifting contest, and I'm, I'm sure I'd be beat by many. But that's not the strength that we're talking about here. True strength is measured by what, how well you can control yourself, your actions, your attitudes, your appetites. A man... Look, think about this. Jesus Christ was one who truly was a man of all men. He was meek, as the Bible describes him. That is not weak. He is a man who possessed all power, all the power of heaven, yet he controlled it. He allowed all those things to be done to him without lashing out. When they took him to the cross, he did not fight back. He did not uh, cry out for justice. He laid as a sheep, led to the slaughter. Jesus went. A man who could have called 10,000 angels and yet chose not to. That's a man of great strength and power. And I think even humanly speaking, when a man who possesses the power to uh, physically destroy his opponent uh, chooses not to, but to control himself, that is strength. And I, I take that from the Bible. Listen to what it says in Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So the, the wisest man on earth said, you know, the, the real strong man is the one who controls his anger and um, ruleth his spirit. Now, it would do us all to, well, uh, to, to remember this. It would do us well to remember that our problems in the spiritual realm here uh, can really be summed up in some of the same problems that Samson had. And so we'll see that hopefully here this morning. But they began with our own hearts, our problem with sin. And when we seek to fulfill our own selfish desires, our own, uh, uh, fulfill our own selfishness, what does James say? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And I know the problem of sin clearly is an eternal problem. You see, it doesn't begin with someone else as we would like to describe it. It's somebody else's fault that I did this or that. It doesn't even begin with the devil. No, the devil can't make you and I do anything, Christian. Our sin problem begins with us. It begins with me. And with our uh, twisted and depraved uh, desires. And so this should be a warning sign to us. When we begin to long for the things that God has forbid, red flags should start flying. There should be, a, in our own hearts and minds, this is a warning sign. There's a problem here spiritually. And 
And then we're headed for trouble. The desire to gratify the lust of the flesh is a sign that we are headed to a, a dangerous road ahead. And we need to take that warning. So his desires, what else did he desire besides a woman? He desired his own way. Uh-oh, look at that. Uh, well, we already read there in verses 1 through 3. There are uh, two statements that are made by Samson here, two strong statements that really jump off the pages of the Word of God and give us a glimpse into the heart of this man. He said there in verse 2, get her for me. Get her for me. No one else. She's the only one I'll, I'll have. And then also in verse 3, he, he says, she pleased me well. Now, Samson's focus is seen here clearly. He's focusing on what he thinks. He's focusing on what he feels and what he wants. Notice that he went to uh, Timnath, and as it said there in verse 1, he saw a woman. And when he saw her, he wanted her, and nothing in the world was going to prevent him from having her. And in fact, not, not his own parents objecting to this. Didn't matter. That wasn't going to prevent him. And uh, no one else, so what, whatever anyone, anybody thought about it, wasn't going to stop him from doing what he wanted to do, getting what he wanted. And uh, not even what was best for the nation of Israel. Didn't matter. And so, in fact, not even what God wanted was a concern for Samson. It wasn't going to stop him from having his own way in this matter. It was against God's will, and I want to clarify this, for Israelites to marry the Philistines. Uh, in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Joshua, clearly uh, God did not want them to intermarry among the Philistines, specifically the Philistines. Uh, but Samson only cared about what's going to make me happy. And, and he lived his life uh, to please himself. And folks, we have a lot of people today. That's right where they are. It's all about me. And I'm not talking just about the world. A lot of Christians are having problems with this as well because we all have the flesh. We all deal with pride, arrogance. We all deal with these things. And so, uh, you know, Samson, though, he, uh, uh, he, he wouldn't let anyone or anything stop him from getting what he wanted. And after all, he was to I remind you, live his entire life as a Nazarite to God in Judges chapter 13. That means Samson was supposed to be separated from this world, separated unto the Lord. For, and not just for a period of time, but for his entire life, Samson was to uh, uh, be true to these vows that he had made. His life was not his own to do as he pleased. Uh, his life was the Lord's to use, and, and however the Lord seemed fit to use it. Now, I know many of you already see the application that can be made there. Uh, and there is an application for you and I this morning. When the Lord God, when he saved us, when he redeemed us, the Bible says he did so unto himself. And he purchased us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Paul says, what, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And, and explains there how the Lord has purchased us with his own blood. We are his possession, according to Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us, or unto himself, a, listen to this, purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now that word peculiar it's not how we would use it. It doesn't mean weird or strange. Uh, it refers to that which is one's own, belonging to one's possession, a people selected by God from other nations for his own possession. And so all that simply means is this. God owns us. God owns us. Christians, we don't have a right to say, well, I demand this or I'm going to do this my way. I don't care. We, now, we can do it. I, 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 again, you can make a bad decision. God will let you make that bad decision, but there are some awful consequences as a result of it. And so he owns us by right of creation. We are his creation. He owns us by the right of redemption. 
he sacrificed his own life, his blood for you and I. But as a result, we should desire to live for him, to uh, desire that his will be done over our own will. And so when we don't, it's, that's a clear warning sign. When we, in our, we may never verbalize it, but we're saying in our heart and mind, I don't want to do that. We know that's what God wants us to do. It's clearly written in the word of God. We know it's his will and we say no to it. Boy, that's a warning sign. Spiritually, there's something wrong and you're headed down a road that's going to be very hurtful, painful, and destructive in your Christian life. So and there, there's a, a word in the New Testament, I believe, that really sums up uh, Samson's attitude and as well as the attitude of many that are living like this today. And that's a word that we don't use today. And that word is lasciviousness. And this word speaks of unbridled lust. It, it speaks of shamelessness. And I think we can clearly see that happening in the world, in our, in our own society. Unbridled lust. Whatever I want, whatever feels good, you can't tell me I can't do it. I am going to do it. And I'm going to be proud of it and public in it. And uh, they also have no shame in doing it. So it, it speaks of an attitude that says, I will do as I please. I don't care what anyone says or thinks about it. It is a me first attitude. And we see that again. I, I, I know it's in a, among Christians as well. Sadly. And how can that be? Well, just like Samson, when we ignore those spiritual warning signs and we keep going down that road, it's going to be a, a very destructive thing in our life. This me first attitude. And so it's it, a mindset that says, all that matters is me getting my way. I don't care who I hurt. Don't care what I say or do. It's, it's just, I want my way. Lasciviousness is a life warning sign, a spiritual warning sign, you're headed for danger. Um, now I, I'm not saying you're headed for hell. If you're saved, you're saved. But Christian, I, I'm telling you, you're headed for a, a terrible mess of a life if you ignore the warning sign of lasciviousness, this unbridled lust, this shamelessness. It's a sign that danger lies ahead for the, the, for the individual that's afflicted with this. So we see Samson's desire. One of the warnings that was in his life that he ignored. Another thing, look at Samson's disrespect. By the way, young person, if you're not married yet, you ought to take some time to look at how your boyfriend, girlfriend, how your future, maybe your future wife or husband, how they treat their mom and dad. I'm telling you, if they have nothing but disrespect for them, they're rude to them, and they, they are willingly and openly going against their wishes, I'm telling you, you better watch it. If they'll behave that way with their own mom and dad now, that's a good picture of what's going to happen in your marriage relationship. I'm, you just be, better be careful about this. Samson was a young man who had no respect for his parents. And in verse 3, we clearly see that. When he's, um, where, uh, oh, I just, I'm sorry, turn the page here. Verse 3, then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. I don't care. So his, here's his parents' charge, if you would. When Samson's, when they hear his parents hear about what he wants, the, to, wants them to do, immediately they give warnings. They say, Samson, don't do this. This isn't right. And uh, uh, to, to follow this course of action would be wrong. So they know that what Samson had planned to do, what he wants to do, is not God's will. They know this clearly. And, and they try to change his mind. And, and uh, by encouraging, hey, marry a good Israelite uh, uh, girl. And what they do is what, any loving parent would know or would try to do even today. Uh, if, if they saw their child about to make a very serious mistake, you know, we'd try to warn them, try to encourage them. 
It's exactly what Paul told parents to do in, back in Ephesians chapter 4, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 4, where Paul said, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's what uh, we ought to strive to do as parents. Your children may not appreciate it, but as a parent, you have the responsibility to warn them. And when they're about to um, do something, it's going to be harmful to their lives. And so sometimes the Lord uses parents to hold up a stop sign, a warning sign. You know, it's really a foolish thing to ignore a warning sign. You know, you know no one, for young people need to understand, there's probably most cases, there's no one else on earth, no one that loves you more than your parents, that wants the best for you. It would be foolish to ignore their warnings and just say, well, I know what's best. What pride and arrogance is that? You better listen to the advice, to the counsel of your parents. And uh, But Samson's, I mean, see that parents make this charge, but I want you to notice his choice, parent, or Samson's choice. Despite the pleas from his parents not to do this, Samson, uh, he is going to go ahead and do what he wants to do, even though it's harmful. For him, he's been told. Now, sometimes, uh, again, the, the phrase, she pleaseth me well, literally means, well, dad, mom, I don't care. This is right in my eyes. I don't care what you say. I don't care what God says. This is right in my eyes. Samson doesn't care what his parents think. He doesn't care what God thinks. He doesn't care what is right or wrong. He just knows what he wants. And all he cares about is what he thinks, what he wants, what he, how he feels, what is pleasing himself. And be careful. If all you desire is just to make you happy and to give you the, the, the things that please you, you better be careful because that's a warning sign, a spiritual warning sign that there's some trouble ahead. So he disrespects his parents' wishes. He disrespects God's will. And uh, this should have been a warning sign in Samson, but he, was, he had gone too far. When there is rebellion in our hearts, that rebellion will manifest itself with disrespect, disrespecting those that we should have respect for, disrespecting God. And when you find yourself doing that, listen, you uh, uh, doing whatever you please with no regard for anyone else, not even God himself, understand, that is a warning sign not to be ignored, and you are headed for trouble for sure. Uh, when you could care less about what God says in his word, I've had people tell me, I know what the Bible says, but what? There should not be any but there at all. This is what God says. This is what is right. There is no other path that's going to be better. Every other path is going to be going against God's will. And when we care less about what, it, what he says in his word, when we care less about how our actions can hurt other people around <laughs> us, and when we uh, show no regard for uh, other people's feelings, and uh, that's when we're headed for trouble. These, these are spiritual signs. The desire to live for self. The desire to do whatever I think is right. What I want, what I feel, it, that's a, a manifestation of a rebellious heart. Rebellion. It's a warning sign, a warning sign that should be heeded. I mean, if some of these things have cropped up in your life, know right now God is trying to warn you. You are heading on the wrong path. You are in for some real hurt if you don't get right with God. You're in, in past. Now, look, life is bigger than you and I. Life is not all about me. And, and uh, you can reverse that for yourself as well. It's not about us. Uh, what, what you do affects everyone around you. You say, well, I'll do as I please. It's my business. And I know what, wait a minute, what you do will affect everybody around you. Your, in, your, your uh, uh, actions will impact your family. Your actions will, will impact your acquaintances, those you work with. Your, your, your actions will impact the church. And so be careful. Disrespect for others, their feelings, their needs. That's a warning sign. Thirdly, I'm going to give you another one, Samson's disobedience. Verses 5 through 9, we see it clearly. 
uh, Samson's parents, so sadly, they kind of uh, give in here. They, they uh, 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 give in to his demands. And uh, they, they sacrifice their convictions. Why? We just want to make our son happy. Now, there is a mistake here. That is never right. Parent, I know there's many times in our lives as a parent, we have to make some difficult decisions. And sometimes that makes our children unhappy. But that's what's best for them. Let's not be so uh, short-sighted that we uh, just think, well, I want to be the best friend with my child, and I want to make them happy. Well, the, the best thing you and I can do to make our children happy and to have joy in their life is to encourage them to walk the will and the will of God and the ways of God. And so there are, there are too many parents who live for nothing but to make their children happy. Let me ask this question. What about the Lord? What about the Lord? Uh, you, you realize that any other avenue, any other path that you take going against the will of God is not going to be a happy path. I don't care how maybe short-sighted it is. Boy, they, they just want this. and They, they really, uh, you know, I want to give them what I never had a chance to enjoy in life. And Boy, we better be careful. What about the Lord? As they go to Timnath to see this woman, Samson apparently wanders off to himself. I'm sure he did this often. But he's passing through a vineyard. And then he's attacked by a lion. He kills a lion with his bare hands. How did he do this? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit's power came upon him. And, and this seems uh, uh, like one of the first uh, uh, events here, the first uh, great feats of strength in Samson's life. But it, this event is also a little bit of a window into Samson's soul. Uh, it reveals a heart that is filled with disobedience. Now, this is another warning sign that Samson should have heeded. Uh, notice the place of his disobedience. Where did this take place at? It says in verse 5, he was attacked by this lion in a vineyard. A vineyard. What in the world is a Nazarite doing in a vineyard? Do you remember, as a Nazarite, he wasn't even supposed to eat of anything of the vine. He was not, uh, uh, the, the grapes or, or any wine he could not have. And according to Numbers chapter 6. And so he, uh, uh, he had no business at all being around a vineyard. He was, what, what was Samson doing? He was putting himself in a place of temptation. Uh, th this uh, simply reveals the disobedient nature of Samson's heart. Yeah, I know I've been told this all my life. I don't care. I can handle it. I'm strong enough. And maybe he thought he was immune to temptation. Maybe he thought the prohibition to this fruit of the vine was for everybody else, but not me. Not me. And so who knows what he thought, but his disobedience is revealed by his placing himself in a place where um, he was tempted to break God's laws. And God, the vows that he made to the Lord. So the same is true for every one of us this morning. When we continually place ourselves in a situation where we can be tempted, then we are revealing the fact that we have a disobedient spirit. When uh, It's almost like we are daring temptation to come. It's almost like we are courting sin. It's um, Now, I would remind you that God commands us to be separate to separate ourselves uh, from sin, not to court it. Come out from among them and be ye separate. So we have the place of his disobedience and then the proof. In verse 7, look there at verse 7 with me again. As the Bible says, And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. So Samson placed his Nazarite vow in jeopardy just by... Uh, you know, being in the wrong place, but his disobedience was manifested in just ignoring all these warning signs and in following his own way, his own lust. And this disobedient heart always reveals itself by disobedient actions. If our heart is disobedient, eventually there's going to come some actions that reveal 
that disobedient heart. Again, Samson, he, uh, it, it does, it, he doesn't care about pleasing God, doesn't, has no regard for God at all here. And uh, nor does he even think about the consequences of his actions. So when you do as you please, even though you know that God does not want you to do that, God is against it, that is a huge, huge red flashing warning sign in your life. And you better heed it or you're headed for trouble. Um, and then in, uh, we see the power of his disobedience. Uh, he uh, put everything in jeopardy here when he touches this dead body. Numbers chapter 6 told him that he was not supposed to do this. Uh, so Samson in verse, uh, oh, let's see, verse 8, and when he returned to uh, take her, he, he, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion that he went and helped himself with that honey. He never should have touched anything associated with a dead body. And yet he does this. Uh, Samson was so full of his own will, so full of his own desires, his own ways, that the things of God held no power over him at all here. And I've seen a lot of people who claim to be Christians who have gotten to that very point as well. God held, holds no power over them. God's word, God's will. Again, Samson didn't care what God wanted. He only cared what he wanted. And he was completely under the spell of his sinful lust and desires. Now, that is the power of our own sinful condition as well. Don't think that you can handle it, that you can put your plate, yourself in the place of temptation and that you're strong enough. No, we're foolish to ignore the warning signs, that just the fact that we would want to uh, associate ourselves with those kind of things ought to be a warning sign. And where we reach a place where we no longer care what God wants. Let me ask you, what does God want from you? We say, well, Pastor, I don't really know what God wants from me. Well, you should. You should be able to give me some Bible answers of what does God want from me in my life? And then the, the second question that would follow is, are you doing that? Are you doing that? I, I pray maybe it's out of ignorance that you have not been in the Word of God. I pray it's not because of your rebellion, your disobedience uh, uh, against the Lord. So Samson was, was con completely controlled by the flesh. And uh, uh, we can allow that to happen in our own lives if we're not careful. Uh, reach a place where all that matters is what we want, what we feel is good and right. And it's a dangerous, dangerous place. And then one more thing about this disobedience, the price. There was a price to pay for this disobedience. In verses 8 and 9, it re is revealed. But when Samson touched the dead lion, he violated his vow to the Lord. The vow was clearly laid out in Numbers chapter 6, verses 9 through 12. He was supposed to be the, uh, go to the priest and offer sacrifices after this was happened. Uh, this had happened. He was supposed to shave his head after this happened. He was supposed to start all over again as a Nazarite because his sin destroyed everything in his life up to that point, according to Numbers chapter 6 and verse 12. Um, so the price would have been forfeiture of everything that he had worked for up to this point. For his own purposes, God doesn't judge Samson here. And uh, now again, we don't always know how God is going to work in different situations. But for this is apparently was God's purpose. We're told there in verse 4 that these events were of the Lord. Now that might have thrown you for a little loop here. What in the world? That doesn't mean that God planned the sin of Samson. Doesn't mean that God is the one that tempted Samson and encouraged him to do wrong. It does mean that God allowed Samson to do what he did. He allowed that sin to happen. It also means that God intended to use Samson's sin to accomplish his will. Now that's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, Samson failed. Samson deserved the, the chastisement of God, the judgment of God. But God is going to give him a, an opportunity. God can use this and to help Samson. And, and so God intended to uh, use this sin, Samson's sin, to accomplish his will. 
So God works the same way today in your life and in mine. He doesn't make us sin. We cannot blame God when we sin. We can't blame the devil either. But uh, he, he does not condone our sins either. Well, God didn't strike me dead, so I guess it means I'm okay. I, I can continue doing what I want to do uh, because God didn't strike me dead with a bolt of lightning and nothing happened yet. Well, uh, no, that, that doesn't, that's not logical at all. But uh, he can use uh, our sins, our failures, to accomplish his own purposes in the lives of people uh, in this world and in us. Do you know someone who has been, maybe they really made a lot of mistakes in life. Their sin was, was horrible, and they're not proud of it. But God, now, when that person got saved or got right, God can turn around and use those bad decisions they made for his glory in helping other people. For instance, a man that's uh, been a uh, slave to the bottle, an alcoholic, or a, uh, a druggie. I've known individuals like that, and God saved them, or God uh, you know, got a hold of their heart where they got right, and now they're able to help other individuals in similar situations because they've been there. Now, I am not advocating, oh, then that's, that's what God had planned all along. No, God's will is not for us to go down those roads. But when we do, he can use it for his own purpose, for his own glory. And I pray that would be the uh, desire that we would have after we've messed up. So anyway, God used, think about this, he used Judah's sin with Tamar to further the line of Christ. God used David's sin with Bathsheba to bring Solomon into the world. Uh, he, he used the betrayal of Judas to get Christ to Calvary. Now, I, I can't explain all these things, honestly, but I can rest in the fact that you and I serve a sovereign God, and we can know that even our sins <laughs> is not going to thwart his plans. I have news for those in the White House, for those who are in leadership of, or in kings or whoever rules wherever in this world. God's will is going to be accomplished. They're not going to thwart God's plan. They can shake their fist in heaven and, and curse God uh, till their dying breath. It's not going to change anything when it comes to God's plan being carried out. It's going to happen just as God says it's going to happen. And for Samson, the price of his disobedience was that he was emboldened to send more. Oh, I guess nothing happened. So he, when, when he broke his vow to God, nothing happened to him. He must have thought, well, I've gotten away with it. And so... This misunderstanding led him to go further down that wrong path, the path uh, that, that would be to his initial ruin. So we don't, um, let me remind you here, we do not get away with sin. Listen, we don't, we don't get away with it, and no one does. It may appear that you have, but you don't. There is a reckoning day, and that's, you know, I, I just tell you that with, with uh, all sincerity. You may even uh, uh, face the consequences of your sins in this life. Don't think that, well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll answer for that when I get to, into eternity. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And it goes on to say, For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so indicating that even in this life, you will surely face God one day, you and I will give an account to him. and for uh, So everyone uh, of us shall give an account of himself to God, according to Romans chapter 14, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, disobedience always carries a high price. Don't think that because nothing happened immediately, that I'm okay, when we identify a, a disobedient heart within ourselves, we should deal with it immediately. That's a warning sign uh, that fr from God that troubles ahead. So Samson's desire, his disrespect, his disobedience, one more, let me throw it out here quickly, his deception is also seen here in verses 6 and verse 9, verse 6 and 9. Honey in a carcass, by the way, is not a strange thing. Here, the dry arid conditions of Palestine, they say, would often 
uh, almost mummify uh, an animal or someone that died. And uh, bees would look for moisture, would move into that mummified remains. Sounds very pleasant, doesn't it? And they'd build their hive there. So this is not an unusual thing. It does happen. I want you to see the ruthlessness of Samson's decision there in verse 9. He is so filled with pride that he never considers the consequences of his own actions. By eating the honey from the lion, what did he do? He defiled himself against the holy God. By giving it to his parents, he caused them to be defiled as well. Um, in Numbers chapter 19, it clarifies that, but his parents have made that vow before the Lord as well. And they ignorantly, so Samson is causing them to defile themselves. He deceived his parents. He caused problems for his parents. So when we willfully disregard God's will for our lives, we always pull, pull others down, don't we? I mean, you know, you, you see it in families all the time. Uh, one member will get out of God's will, and they'll begin to pull, oftentimes, one or two down with them. And, and so, uh, you know, they, they uh, make they, our decision to, to go against God's will will impact uh, the decisions that others make as well. Wickedness in our lives always impacts the lives of those around us. And that's part of the deception of sin. Um, it blinds our eyes to the true consequences of our actions. We think, oh, it's just, it's just me. I'm not hurting anybody but myself. And all we see is the, the pleasure, though. Uh, we can never see the pain. And so Samson was so blinded, he was even hurting his own parents without even knowing it. And then the reason for his deception, Samson hid his sin because uh, he didn't want his parents to know about it. He didn't want his parents to know that he had defiled himself. Had they known, his parents would have demanded that he, uh, you know, get things right, fulfill the requirements of the law of God. And he hid his sin because he didn't want others to think less of him. He thought he was something special. He knew that he was right with God and he uh, probably felt a little bit smug that I'm living a separate life that nobody else knows about. Sinful men do not like to sin alone. Alone, They want to sin with others. They, uh, it, it's the way of the world. The, the world tries its best to uh, sin, and, and they, they uh, 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 use sinful, like, like for instance, sinful products. They use uh, things that are glamorous and appealing to try to get a person to sin. And in the same way, sinful people love to pull others into their wickedness. They don't want to be alone in their wickedness. They will do this by tempting them, by putting pressure upon them uh, to uh, uh, partake, to, to uh, be involved in what their sin, to join them in their sin. And they do it also by gossiping and turning others against that person because they want to hurt them. And uh, so wicked people are never content to enjoy their wickedness all alone. Misery loves company, and so does uh, sort of miserable sinners. So there's another issue here that I, I believe needs to be mentioned before I close in prayer. There's a uh, perverseness in sin. Again, I, I alluded to it a moment ago, that makes the sinner feel superior uh, to others because he has a secret life. And nobody knows about it. And nobody's aware of it. The, the sinner forgets, however, God knows. God knew about Samson, what he had done, and what he was thinking in his heart. God knew everything, and God knows everything about you and I as well. And so this one final thought in this passage I believe we need to close with is that the believer would do well to take inventory of the company that he keeps or she keeps. Your friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're not going to turn there for the sake of time, but in verse 33, there's a great danger in having the wrong kinds of close friends. Um, evil people may appear to be friendly, but they're not your friends when, when they entice you to do things, to join with them in doing things that are against the will of God, that are obviously wrong, that will defile. You know what? Even professing Christians... If he or she is living a worldly life 
And they, they don't want to do it alone. They'll try to pull other Christians down and to have a, 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 as close friends so that they won't be alone. And it makes them look better. Uh, it helps them to, to quiet the cries of their consciousness uh, and the guilt. Well, so-and-so is with me now doing this. I don't feel so bad. And so maybe that's why Paul said, withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. You know, it doesn't matter if they just claim to be a Christian. If they're doing wrong, it's still wrong. And so don't, don't justify it by saying, well, they're a Christian, so I, I can go along with them. And uh, maybe I'm not going to do what they're doing, but no, you better be careful. Withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly. Imagine for a moment how Samson's life would have been different if he had recognized these warning signs if, if, and turned his life around. I, I, you know, imagine now what God could do with you and I if we would just simply be obedient to him, recognize these warning signs that are maybe present in our lives and say, Lord, I don't want to go down this path anymore. And can you, maybe this morning, God has revealed some warning signs. Let me encourage you to heed them. Get right with God. Um, and don't continue down a road that's going to be a road of ruin, of hurt, not only for yourself, but for those around you. And, uh, of course, if you're not saved, um, you know, we'll see in the life of Samson, as a believer, his life ended with a catastrophe. And so can the life of someone today who continues to go willfully, uh, headstrong in their own will and way and against God. It, and it may not be too late to come before the Lord now and to get things right. Avoid that hurt, that destruction. Let's pray together here this morning.